Um, hopefully I'll keep this pretty informal this morning. Um, if you have questions at any point, feel free to just raise your hand, word out, whatever. Um, hopefully I can give you guys a little bit more clarity as to what's going on in the tech industry right now. Um, and hopefully you guys can walk away a little bit more from um, Yeah, I'm Mark Heller. I graduated two years ago uh, from this wonderful university um, in computer science. Um, I decided for some strange reason to pack all of my stuff and move to Oregon. Um, so I'm visiting from Oregon now. So, brief introduction as to who I am. Um, I don't know if you guys know this crazy character in the middle, uh, Dr. Lewis from Computer Science. Um, I did research with him one summer. Um, it was super awesome. And he is probably my biggest mentor, um, both when I was back here and today. And anyway. uh, like I said, I work for Intel. Um, I actually recently just started doing IT recruiting. Um, so I go to college campuses now and talk about how wonderful it is to work for Intel and try to convince other young people that they want to work there as well. Um, it's pretty awesome, but it's definitely part of my job. Um, I'm a software developer. Um, I do programming just about every day. Um, I have a little bit of a hybrid role from a traditional developer, though. Um, I work with other developers to help them develop better. Um, and I think that's a really good role for me uh, because not only am I able to write code myself, um, I'm able to talk to other developers and help them write code a little bit better too. So, like I said, I packed up all my stuff and moved to Oregon. Uh, this is actually Punchbowl Falls. Um, I go hiking quite a lot now because uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, I got a French Bulldog. It's my dog, Rue. Uh, he's also pretty cool. Um, and I also recently just purchased a house. Um, so I'm hearing a lot of things that millennials can never afford a house, they're always gonna be in apartments, this, that, and the other. I'm here to tell you that that's not entirely true. Um, I was able to afford a house. I moved it over the summer, and it's fantastic. Um, so I, I like that. It's another notch on the belt. And uh, this is another picture I was at um, University of Illinois um, in Champaign. Um, and these are some of the guys that I was recruiting with. We, we traded our sweet Intel swag for some John Deere hats. Um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. So yeah, I have a couple slides about things I'll talk about and things I won't talk about. Um, just kind of lay in the, the ground here. Um, so things I will talk about is my experience. I can definitely go into depth about anything that I've experienced, but for the most part, it's been positive, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, I had a internship at Friedrich Air, uh, which is actually right up 281. Um, they're in the AMG Bank building by the airport. Um, pleasant experience, no problem there. Um, and then Intel so far, fantastic, wonderful. And we'll talk a little bit about um, why I think that's been so positive. Um, but unfortunately, kind of goes to the rest of the, the presentation, I'm going to talk about the things that I'm hearing. Um, I have a lot of peers that will reach out to me and ask for advice or just kind of um, let me be a sounding board for them because they are struggling with various things, whether it's finding a mentor, um, working with their group, or working with their manager, and a lot of it unfortunately has to do with the, the male and female um, dynamic in the workplace. Um, so some of the things we'll see is I have a, a slide on the recent hiring numbers for some of the, the big names um, in tech. And I kind of chose to stay with the, the bigger companies uh, because that's what I'm more familiar with. Intel has over 100,000 people. Um, that's a big company. Um, there's more companies that are on the startup side that are going to be under 100. Um, I can't really talk a whole lot about that. I do have a couple friends that are in startups. Um, and the culture is definitely different. Um, so we'll point out a couple things there. Um, and then finally, I know that you guys have probably heard a lot about uh, Grace Hopper. There's kind of two big call outs there that I wanted to go over. One was um, Microsoft's whole system of raises, and you should just believe in karma. Um, and then also the male allies panel, which probably made me a little bit more angry than Microsoft. But. We'll get to that later. So things 
I won't talk about. If you guys have heard about Gamergate, I don't want to talk about it. And part of it is because I don't fully appreciate why it started. Um, I'm in no part a member of the community on Gama Sutra that started this whole debate. And this is Intel's giant press release because we somehow got ourselves stuck. Um, just some background in case you don't know what Gamergate is. Um, there's a gaming site, Gama Sutra. They do journalism for games, um, both indie games and uh, more mainstream games. And I don't really know the facts behind it, which is part of the reason why I don't want to speak on it. Um, but Intel had ads um, that were on this site, and they randomly decided to pull their ad campaign. And it made it sound like the people who were fighting for Gamergate somehow won um, by lobbying and getting Intel to pull their ads from this site, therefore pushing their agenda. And Intel basically said, no, that's not the case. Um, and it's just, there's a lot of hairy things. It's an open investigation. I don't really know. I don't want to speak towards it. And I don't want to come to you guys as an Intel PR person because I'm not. I'm an IT computer science. I don't have a clue what they were doing. I didn't hear about it until I heard it from the public. So this is my thoughts on Gamergate, which is the Intel PR statement that basically says, we like diversity. We treat everyone equal. Um, the very kind of PC response. So to get into my experience, um, like I said, I worked for Free Drink as um, an intern. I spent a summer there, and then they actually extended it into my senior year. Um, and so this is a picture of me and my boss. Um, there's about 100 employees that work in their headquarters. And like I said, that's in San Antonio. It's right up the road. Um, they also have a whole manufacturing uh, line that sits in Mexico. Um, so those employees are not counted in the, the 100 that are in the headquarters. Um, so the funny thing about that was I get to this, this job and I'm sitting in the engineering group and I realize I'm the only woman. There is one other woman that sits on that side of the building and she's the admin for the engineering department. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Um, they didn't have any programmers either. So not only was I the only female, I was the only programmer. So I was sitting around a bunch of guys who were um, electrical engineers, civil engineers, mechanical engineers, they all knew how to make air conditioning units, but they didn't know how to write the software that was either running on the air conditioning units, and they definitely didn't know how to write the software to test the air conditioning units. So it was a little bit of an interesting experience when I come in, because not only am I the only girl, which by the way, all 100 employees in the headquarters knew exactly who I was, because I was that intern that sat in engineering, um, but they also knew that I was a programmer. So suddenly I found myself in all of these meetings with the board for Free Drink, um, talking about how we could expand our air conditioning units to fit a wide variety of needs and how we were going to do that with better software. Um, so I helped them kind of understand what was going on in tech. They wanted to be able to turn on their air conditioning units from their phone, but they didn't really know how they were going to do that. They wanted to schedule their air conditioning units from a web application. They didn't really know how to do that. Um, so I, I sat down and kind of coached them through it and then encouraged them to go out and either hire more people who were doing software or uh, hire consultants uh, to kind of help them out. Um, but it was kind of funny that before I came in, the whole company was kind of ran by their marketing department. So when marketing decided something like, oh, it'd be really cool if we could have an app on our phone. They'd come into the engineering department, they'd say, okay, I want to be able to run my air conditioning unit with my phone. Can you give that to me? And the engineers were like, uh, I don't know. We have to make them Wi-Fi compatible, we have to do this, we have to do that, we can't just give you that. Um, so I kind of helped the engineering department understand that they can't have their tech specs drawn up by people who are marketing, um, just because it's not how that works. Someone who's really good at marketing is not necessarily really good at hardware, and that's just kind of how it is. Um, but from a female perspective, aside from the fact that I was kind of alone, I was okay with it. Um, and part of it was computer science. There was, I think, 22 majors my year, and five of them were females. It was a record high um, for the recent graduating classes. So being one or being one of a few was normal to me. Um, and as long as I got the work done, my coworkers didn't care. 
They were very happy to hear what I had to say, um, and they never really treated me differently. Um, so again, a very positive experience, and kind of prepped me for the real world. I was like, okay, I can do this. I can be a woman in a, in a computing or engineering field um, at a company that's either making hardware or making air conditioning units. I'm gonna jump ahead to my Intel job. So these are a couple of my coworkers at our quarterly event. Um, so Intel's a little bit bigger. Like I said, over 100,000. Um, we have roughly 17,000 in the U.S. I'm hearing that that's probably only the number for Oregon, um, but we've got a lot of people. Um, we have about 5,000 in IT. Like I said, that's the group that I sit in. Um, but of that 5,000, I have 19 teammates, four of which are, are females, which I think is pretty cool, um, and I think it's also pretty high. Um, but of my 12 teammates that I actually sit with in Oregon, I'm the one and only female. Um, so, I again, wasn't too bothered. Um, I'm used to it, no big deal. Um, but what I can tell you is I recently moved into a smaller building. So instead of being in one of the big buildings at Intel where we have our fabrication facilities, we're making chips, um, I'm in a smaller lease office that contains a data center. And often I walk in and I count how many women I see throughout the day. And it's usually zero. Um, with the exception of the woman who works at the security desk Monday through Wednesday. That's it. Um, to the point where I go into the bathroom, for instance, and if someone else walks into this four stall bathroom, I kind of freak out because I'm like, there's another woman. I should probably get to know her. And then I seek her out. I like walk through the building or I walk through the cafe. I'm like, gotta find her, gotta find her, gotta, find her. gotta keep her here. Um, there's probably about five women that actually sit in that building. And there's probably about 120 people who are supposed to sit in that building at any given point. Um, and like I said, about five more women. Um, again, I didn't really let that bother me. I was always interested to know if there was other women in the building, but I wasn't really upset that I was the only woman. Um, but what I did start to do um, was I wanted to reach out to the, the female community in either Computing, programming, design, something. So I took to Twitter and I said, okay, I want to follow other web developers. And so I was following some of kind of the prominent men in the industry, but then I started seeking out women individually um, to see what their thoughts were, what companies they're at, what they're doing, is their experience any different? And that's kind of where everything just kind of fell off. Um, so looking at Twitter in the morning, drink my coffee, and I see this tweet from a woman who does freelance consulting for user experience, um, which is kind of something that I would like to do. Um, I like both working with customers, I like programming, and I like writing good code that people, everyday people can use, not just something who's super technical. And she made a comment about how she's attending this conference and she's very excited, except for the fact that she's not being paid. And then she continues to tweet, I found out that I'm not getting paid, but I found out that the males that are attending this conference are all getting paid. So she reached out to the conference leader and basically said, you know, I hope this is an oversight. I hope that I'm not hearing this correctly. Um, and I just, I was so immersed in, in the story and I'm, I'm reading her blogs and I'm reading the responses that are coming back from this conference. and it kind of inspired me to want to follow more women that were experiencing these things. Um, so for this story, it's a little bit more positive. Um, there was four panel speakers. Um, they were all being paid. All the other speakers at the conference were not being paid. The four panel speakers all happened to be men. Um, and when word got out that those four speakers, who again happened to be men, were the only ones being paid, um, the female community that was attending this conference basically said, well, we respect that you're only paying those four speakers because of their role. Um, we would appreciate that they would have reserved the spot for a female. Because right now, it just really looks like you paid the males that are attending this conference, not you're paying these four panel speakers and not the others. Um, so that was kind of the first time I got a little taste of something weird, something different, something that just kind of made me go, you know, I really hope this isn't because I'm a female, or I really hope this isn't because my coworker is a female. I really
really hope that there's a misunderstanding or that in this case that somebody was being paid or a group of somebody's were being paid and others were not. Um, and I really wanted to, to get a little bit more invested in what was going on in this, in this community and why other women were having such a poor experience or why they were, they were so upset. So let's kind of step back, talk about some recent hiring numbers. So I pulled some information from opendiversitydata.org. And if you guys haven't been there and you're looking for numbers, um, it's a good place to start for a variety of companies. Um, you can also go and see who's actually submit their data and who hasn't. Um, I chose a handful of companies that are, again, kind of similar to Intel. Uh, this is Apple. And you'll notice that Apple is 70% male, 30% female. But as far as tech is concerned, we're sitting around 20 females. Um, I think that number is actually high. I'm very impressed with Apple because I know a couple people who work for Apple, one of which sits in their Bluetooth department. And he said he doesn't see women ever when he goes into work. Um, and I don't know if that's the case because he's working more with hardware. And there just happens to not be women in hardware. Uh, but he was actually surprised that it was a whole 20%. Um, up in the top of the middle is Microsoft. Uh, that's just a breakdown of their whole workforce, uh, not divided into tech or a region. Um, top corner looks like Facebook. That's because it is. Um, and then down here is Google. I was kind of surprised by these numbers. I was surprised that Apple was what I thought was so high. I was surprised that Microsoft at 28% female was what I thought was so low. Um, and this is, this is based on my perception of these companies. Um, the recent conference that I was at in Portland, we had a fair amount of people come in from Microsoft, because Microsoft is kind of technically just up the road. Um, and they have female work groups. They have um, babysitting things on campus. They have all of these women's groups. And I thought for sure the number would be higher than 28% at that point. Um, but it's not. Um, I asked one of the, the Microsoft employees if she could sense a female presence on campus when she's walking around, and she actually said no. Um, so she thinks 28% is really low. She says she has no visibility into her other female coworkers unless she kind of does what I do when I hear people open the bathroom doors. She goes and seeks them out. Um, and especially if she can figure out if they're a new hire, she goes, seeks them out, and then like kind of forces them to go to lunch with her. She like sits them down, she's like, okay, how's your experience? What are you doing? Tell me all about yourself, and tries to make that connection almost immediately. Because um, the big problem here, and these numbers don't reflect it, is we have a lot of people who are graduating with, with STEM degrees. They're going off into the tech industry, they're going off into other industries, but they're not staying. So that identifies another problem, okay? We're, we're trying to increase our STEM majors. We get there. We're seeing them more in classes. Computer science is seeing more females coming through, and that's fantastic. But the next hurdle is, OK, they go off and they apply for a job. They get a job. Like, let's say they come to Intel with me. I've already had five female coworkers quit Intel, and they started two years ago. And it's for a variety of reasons. Some is they're relocating with their significant other. Um, but of the three, that I know of, two of which quit because they could not work with their group. Their group was all men for both of them, which I thought was extremely coincidental, but both of them were having problems being hurt. One was very technical, like me. She was a software developer. She would write code, um, and they weren't using a repository like GitHub. Um, they were just kind of doing live coding, paired programming, two of them together. And her partner, coworker, was deleting her code and would go home at the end of the night and delete her code, write whatever he wanted. They show up the next morning. She'd be like, hey, where, where's my code? He'd say, oh, I can't. This is so much better. She'd look at it and she'd go, OK, that's, that's fine. Um, and then what she started doing is towards the end of the day, she'd take a screenshot of what code that they had written or what they were working on. And she was trying to build a case to show her manager um, because she thought it was incredibly unfair that she was writing code and that it was never reflected in the final outcome. So she starts doing these screenshots. She comes to her manager. Her manager says, well, that's part of paired programming. 
is sometimes the two of you sit down, you have a disagreement, and the final outcome is not always what you agree upon. She basically said that that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is none, zero, of my code ever makes it. And he said, well, that's probably because you're inexperienced and new. So she basically said, you know what? If no one's going to listen and my manager's not going to listen, I'm going to go to my second level manager. And at Intel, we have an open door policy. So you can talk to literally anyone. Um, our CEO, BK, Brian Krasnick, um, he more than happy to answer your emails. Um, it's a little slow, but if I wanted to, I could fire off an email to the CEO. And so she kind of worked up her management chain. She talked to her second level manager and said, hey, my code's being deleted. And he said the exact same thing. Third manager, same thing. So she said, you know what, Intel's not the company that I want to work for. She walked away. Unfortunately, she didn't reach out to anyone other than her management chain. So by the time I got an email that said, hey, I'm leaving, I immediately responded back and I said, whoa, what's going on? I thought you were very happy here. I thought you were excited that you were coding. And the response was, I'm not happy. Okay. So she leaves. Um, I finally get a chance to meet up with her later. And she tells me this, this story. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm really upset that you didn't reach out to me. Um, and she said, I think it's because I'm a woman. And she was concerned that if she got me involved, that I would be targeted as well, potentially, or I just wouldn't be able to help because I would also be labeled as inexperienced and kind of a cover. Um, but she had other team members who started when she did that were male that weren't experiencing the same issue. Um, so kind of a bummer. Um, as far as Intel is concerned with numbers here, they gave me some big ugly chart. And I wasn't about to try to turn this into something that looked more like the, um, the actual diagrams that you guys are seeing. But you can kind of see a little bit, especially towards the top with our executive and senior officers and managers, how few and far between those numbers are, um, with the exception of glaringly obvious white men. Um, one thing that I can say is the CIO, Kim Stevenson, who's a female, um, recently, fairly recently, um, our CEO, Paul O'Leary, stepped down, he retired. Um, and then instead of just replacing him with a CEO, we now, for the first time, have a CEO and a president. So I talked about BK being our CEO. Our president is a female, Renee. Um, Renee came from the software side of the house, so she's a lot like me in a sense that she was technical. Um, she's now more of a manager, so she probably wouldn't write code. Um, but we have at least two high-ranking females at Intel um, that I have some pretty good visibility into, seeing what they do. And um, fortunately, because I'm doing more of the IT recruiting, um, and I've also been involved with the onboarding. So that means you accept the job offer at Intel, especially in IT. Um, you start day one, you get an email from me. It says, hey, welcome to Intel. So I'm excited to have you. Help me spend the CIO's money by coming to happy hours and all these functions and stuff and get to know me. And that's kind of how I started intercepting more young women, just to see how they were doing um, and to kind of check in on them and make sure if we're getting them, or are we keeping them? They see numbers like this and they get a little bit nervous. And part of it is, again, this is a reflection of currently, or 2014, um, they don't see the numbers that are coming and going. So when they join the workforce, they're like, oh, fantastic, we're going to have more women, it's very exciting. But they don't see the drop-off number until they start getting those same emails like I was getting from my coworkers or my peers that said, hey, I'm leaving Intel. I've only been here 18 months, but I don't want to do this anymore. And that's a little bit scary for them. Um, but like I said, we do have two high-ranking females, which is very encouraging because we only had a CIO at one point. Um, everybody else was a guy. So now I'm going to kind of move into the rumors. Um, one of the big ones, and I can kind of talk about um, startup culture. I have a couple friends that are in startups in the Bay Area. Um, but one of the big, big issues that they're having right now is very frequently, they have a problem with when they're hiring a senior HR person. So 
So you come into a startup, everybody's super excited about their idea, or they're super excited about their technology, they want to make the latest and greatest app. But then they bring more people in because they realize that they need to move faster. They want to make money, they want to get off the ground, so they start pulling in resources. Those resources tend to be people who are geared towards making the product, whether that's software, whether that's an application, whether that's something that's more physical, like know, a, a bicycle, for instance. Or making the latest and greatest bicycle, you want to put a good team together. Most of the time, they don't think that they need to hire someone who's a senior HR person because they don't think we need to have people here to help the company grow. They don't understand, they know, okay, I need an accountant because we're bringing in more money, or I need an accountant to tell me what I'm supposed to do with this money. But they don't understand that they need somebody who's in human resources to help disputes that might come up or to help understand why a woman would be asking for something like maternity leave, or why maybe a male is asking for paternity leave, for male bonding time. They don't understand that. They're very focused on, I need to get this product out, and I need to get it out right now. Um, so one of the, the stories that comes up there is with GitHub, um, which is a code repository um, tool. Uh, Julianne Horvath, who's very, very vocal um, in the female programming development design community. Um, I don't know if you guys read any articles about her. Um, she worked at GitHub in the Bay Area for a while, and then she dramatically left, like packed her stuff, moved to Seattle, and said, this is ridiculous. Um, part of it is centered around the fact that she was having some HR issues. Um, she had been dating someone at GitHub, and suddenly that opened up this conversation that everyone else thought that they could talk about her relationship at GitHub. And it was basically water cooler conversations. It was who she was sleeping with, if she would sleep with someone else, and how she was advancing herself. How she wasn't a really good developer or a really good designer, but she was really good at dating people. And she basically said, you know, I need to talk to someone in HR. So she reached out to an HR representative, but the HR representative wasn't someone who was experienced. And GitHub was growing exponentially at this point. They were pulling in people left and right, they were trying to make the best product, but they were not focusing on the people that they had been in there. Um, so that I know is still kind of an open conversation. Um, she, like I said, did reach out to an HR rep that was there, but her problem was beyond that. It was one of the founder's wives was coming at her and saying malicious things and kind of just beating her down and trying to say, okay, well, you need to conform and you need to do this. And she just, she felt very uncomfortable and she had no one to go to. And so when she left GitHub, she basically said, you know what, you guys you need someone from a senior HR perspective to come in and really analyze what's going on in the company because she felt like she had nowhere to turn. Um, and especially when people start talking about her relationships, that's not something that you need to talk about in the office. And when you have a small office, like GitHub, you kind of have nowhere to go. Um, so she decided to leave, and she started picking up little pet projects along the way to help women, starting in high school and college age, pursue careers in tech in a safe environment, in a safe place. So she pairs them with mentors, and I say she, it's a whole, whole group of people, um, but she's one of the people who's spearheading this. And it's basically a campaign that says, okay, we know that there's problems that exist in tech right now. We're going to try to get you with a mentor, and we're going to try to get you into a company that's going to help you facilitate your growth, your career, and we want to keep you for as long as possible. Um, so kind of along the same lines as Julie's story is just dating in Silicon Valley in general. So it's not something that you think about, but you want to go on a date. You're single, you're excited, so you go to an app go to an internet dating site, and you, you find someone, you're super excited, and you fall into going on a date with someone who's labeled like a bro grammar. Someone who is super excited about the code that they write, and that's about it, and they're only there for a hookup. So you're like, okay, that's fine, whatever, next person. You see it again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And it's now permeating the workplace. So you, you thought, you're like, okay, well, I'm just going to avoid dating for a while. This is how it's going to be. This is, this is the hookup culture that America generated. I'll just pull myself out of that. And then suddenly, 
those profiles that you made are popping up amongst your coworkers, who also happen to be young people who are potentially looking for dates or potentially looking for hookups, and suddenly they're now talking about you at work. And they're talking about who in this community has maybe dated you or maybe something else, and suddenly that's become a hot topic at work. I don't know how to explain it. I work for Intel. I'm probably one of the youngest people in Intel, or at least in my building, by 12 years. So I don't experience things like that. Um, but I have coworkers who would really like to go out on dates, and they can't do it. And then if they do go out on a date, it potentially happens to be someone who knows someone who knows someone who sits in her building. And then suddenly it's like, oh, I know who swiped left, I know who swiped right, and suddenly everyone is talking about your business. And it's not helping your company. And in some cases, people are looking to go out on dates because they know you work at a certain company and they want to get some sort of intellectual property that you have. So we have this problem with Intel. Intel, like the computer that I'm running right now, trade secrets, designs of chips, how exciting. We have people who in the past have gone on dates with people who work for other companies like AMD and have had their computer stolen by the person who they went on a date with. And then suddenly they don't want to go on dates anymore. Oh, I don't know where you left your computer. You must have left it somewhere. Stole their computer to gain ID. So not only do we have these programmers who are like, I write the best code ever, you should totally go on a date with me. We also have these people who are like, I know you work for Intel, and I know your computer might have trade secrets on it, and I'm going to steal it. Awful. Terrible. The other thing is, I'd like to assert that programmers don't exist. Because I don't think they exist in the Portland area. They might exist in the Bay Area. But the big problem is, this perception of programmers is that they make women uncomfortable. So if you guys have seen the show, Silicon Valley, um, I've watched maybe 10 minutes of the pilot, and I turned it off. Because it's a bunch of dudes talking about how wonderful they are, talking about how amazing they are, talking about their muscles, and how they're drinking protein shakes. They make women uncomfortable. So even if they don't exist, like I assert that they don't exist in the Portland area, there are still people who come up to me, particularly at these college campuses, and they say, am I going to have to deal with programmers at Intel? No, you get to deal with really awkward, really old nerds. They're totally different. <laughs> um, but they make women uncomfortable. No woman wants to walk into a workplace and see a bunch of guys flexing and talking about how great their pecs are. Women might like that on the beach. They want to come and do their job. So even if they don't exist, they make women uncomfortable. But this is probably my favorite quote ever. And I got it from my drunk friend one time at happy hour. And he leaned over and he said, I like working in groups of men and women because I think we drive toward the better solution. And I'll leave the tech industry if I can't do my best. And I was like, what, Zeph? Why do you want to work with more women? Is it because you want to date these women? He goes, no. Because I think women have good ideas. And I think I have terrible ideas. And I think the other men that I work with have terrible ideas. And I want to work in more diverse groups because I think we can do better. And I want to do better. I was like, okay, have you talked to your manager about this? And he said, yes. I said, okay, is your manager doing anything? He said, yes. I'm like, okay, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm going to the Intel Women's Conference. And I think it's going to be so awkward because I'm going to be the only dude there. I said, you know what, Zach, that's awesome. Thank you for stepping up. Thank you for being one of those guys who says, I want to do this because I think it drives to a better solution. He thinks his projects are more creative. He thinks his designs are more creative. He thinks everything is a little bit better when he works with a more diverse group. And while I don't agree with the fact that he would leave the tech industry if they don't fix it, I'm hoping, he's still at Intel, that he continues to stick around to help make the tech industry better. Because I don't think he's the only one that says statements like this. I just happen to catch him at a good time. So, some of the other scary things that I heard, and these are pretty close to direct quotes that I got from um, some of the women in computing from the Northwest region, um, the, the conference that I went to. Um, that I found terrifying. So it's things like, I contribute to open source projects. Awesome, fantastic. But as a female, I have a male profile because I don't want to be attacked. What? 
why would you think you would be attacked? If you write good code, what's the problem? And basically, this woman was like, I just want to be accepted by the community. Another one says Stack Overflow, which I don't know if you guys know Stack Overflow. It's code snippets, help. Um, she said that no one accepted the answer she posted as a female. So she jokingly, one night with a friend, made a male profile, found a male picture, used one of her friend's pictures, and used his information. And suddenly she had a 100% acceptance rate. And she copied and pasted the answers that she had written as a female. And again, that's a situation where she said, I so desperately thought it wasn't because there was a female, but it looks really, really coincidental. Um, the other thing was, and I know I, I, I'm talking about the tech industry and kind of trying to leave the gaming industry alone, um, but numerous people game online, and they don't let anyone video chat with them. They don't let anyone chat with them online. They only do typing. They are very secure about what they allow because they're masking themselves as a male because they're afraid they'd be kicked out of games. They're afraid that they wouldn't be able to play games because no one would want to play with a girl, let alone be beat by a girl. I'm okay with that. And that's upsetting to me. Um, it's upsetting to me that no one would want to stand up and say, this is the correct code, this is the correct answer, just because I'm a female doesn't mean it's wrong. Um, and I think part of the reason why this upsets me so much is in high school, Again, I was the only girl in the Java 1 class that I took my junior year. Um, and a couple of my classmates refused to accept help from me because I was the girl. So much so that I wrote it down one time, handed it to my friend who did accept that my answers were correct, even though I was a girl. And he turned around and handed it, the correct answer, to his friend behind him who refused to listen to me, and suddenly it was an accepted answer. That was the one and only time that I faced that. So this really resonates with me. But to this day, I will say I will not make a male profile just to be accepted by the community. I would fight like hell as a female to make sure this doesn't happen. So to the excuses before we dive into Grace Hopper, um, my also kind of favorite excuses these ones center around the fact that clearly all men who are in computer science have some sort of health problem. Mental disability is the one that people like to hone in on. Because clearly every awkwardly nerdy guy that I work with has autism. What? So Jeff Atwood, really good JavaScript developer. Really good at blogging. Also really good at telling you that he's a really terrible person. He just doesn't understand how to work with other people. Not just women, other people in general. So he goes and he writes this article, What Should Men Do? And it's in a response to another article written by a woman that says, what should women do? And unfortunately, the woman who this article was in response to took hers down because of Jeff Atwood's response. That Jeff Atwood said, oh, it's really great that we have more women, and I think we should have more women, but there's not really a man problem here. The problem is that women don't understand that the majority of men who gravitate towards computer science or gravitate towards tech exhibit the traits that would probably link them to having Asperger's or autism, or sitting somewhere along those spectrums, whether it's mild and they're just kind of labeled as quirky, or they are very high functioning, but just not so good with social skills. So that caused chaos on my Twitter feed with all of the women that I follow. All the developers, all the designers basically told Jeff Atwood he was wrong. You can't label an entire community as someone with mental illness when, okay, yes, it's a little bit higher in men, but you can't tell me that every person who gravitates towards making computers work has autism. It's ridiculous. The unfortunate part was he makes that statement, and then there's other articles that are popping up, like this Wired article, The Geek Syndrome, which basically talks about how this debate that's going around that says, oh, 
the kids in Silicon Valley that are being raised are being raised by potentially parents that are both working for tech companies, both working long hours, neglecting their children, and therefore giving them some sort of mental illness. Again, autism. Because they're not loved enough, they're not hugged enough, mommy and daddy work late hours, they ignore the kid, and they're trying to link that with the surge in kids that were diagnosed with autism in California. And I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's fair. I don't think there's enough science to back it up. I'm all about data. I'm all about results. I don't think that that's fair. So then they get into, okay, well, if it's not the lack of affectionate parenting, maybe it's genetic. And maybe because, again, going back to Jeff Atwood's statement, the people who gravitate towards programming exhibit some sort of traits that are linked to autism or Asperger's. I just, I need more science there. I need more facts. I need more data. I need them to study that a little bit more. But telling me that two parents who work in the tech industry are going to somehow create a child with autism, I think that's ridiculous. We would have way more autistic children. But I don't know. I'm not in those studies. I don't read those studies. I'm hoping they're doing a little bit more. But I thought that that was interesting. Let's casually slap an excuse on a problem, both people in the tech industry and, unfortunately, the children that are being born out of the tech industry. And let's slap a label on them, like autism. So now, to the good stuff, Microsoft, Microsoft software. So I heard that you guys kind of know a little bit about this. Um, so I just want to kind of want to talk about it from my perspective. So I know, and I've known since I got a job at 16, that men are paid more than women. Um, at the YMCA that I worked at, men were paid an entire quarter more than women. And we were working minimum wage jobs. So I knew I started at 6.50 and I knew my male peers did not. I didn't know that it was exactly a quarter until later, but they did. Um, I was a lifeguard, so I kind of said, oh, it's because men can lift more, and didn't let it bother me, but it bothered a lot of my coworkers. Um, so when I hear something like, oh, have faith in the system, I want to believe that everybody starts at the same rate. I want to believe that your experience drives how you're being paid. I want to believe that it's a, a results-oriented scale. But I'm not sure it is. Um, I know where Microsoft is coming from, um, because I think Microsoft, in this sense, is a lot like Intel. Um, I think we have it set up so that we have a good metric for when you give people raises, how high the raise is, what they come in as starting. But I don't know for sure that I'm being paid as much as a peer with my same experience or with my same results. Um, so I would hope that the system that's in place, particularly at Intel, is protecting me and is giving me the money that I think I so rightfully deserve, but I don't know. Um, so I get it with trusting the system. What I don't get is karma, and I don't get that it's somebody else's responsibility to make sure that I'm safe, um, or that I'm being paid what I should be. Um, what I also don't fully understand is the whole concept of that women are less likely to negotiate for raises or promotions. I know some very vocal women that I work with who have outright demanded promotions and raises, and they've come in to our performance review season, which we call Focal, and they've sat down with their manager and they have a presentation. They're like, these are five reasons why I deserve more money. And they, they make it fact-based. I led this project. I drove this to completion. I delivered this in six weeks less than I told you I would. And their managers are like, mm, no, we don't have enough money to do that. We don't have enough dollars. And they're like, OK, that's fine. So I know that they're not the norm, necessarily, but I know they're trying. So 
I don't know if I fully appreciate that statement. I know if I felt like I needed a raise, I would walk in and try to negotiate one. But that's the kind of relationship that I have with my manager. I can't speak towards anyone else's. I can also tell you if I sat down and I showed my manager five reasons why I should get raised, he would probably tell me before I started explaining the five reasons that they didn't have the dollar amount to give me a raise. He wouldn't wait until I got to the end of the list. Waiting until the end of the list is a little shady. The other thing that happened at Grace is this male allies panel. So we have Facebook CTO, we have Google's senior vice president of search, we have the CEO of GoDaddy, who, whoa, whatever, <laughs> and then we have the CTO of Intuit. So we'll talk about Dearest Blake at GoDaddy. So he likes to pat himself on the back because when he came in to GoDaddy, he basically said, we're not gonna do any more of those sexist suit world commercials. We're not gonna have the models flaunt whatever, and then go see GoDaddy for the end of this. He didn't want that anymore. So that's how he likes to say he got a seat on this panel. But we'll see some quotes on the next slide where he probably shouldn't have been on that panel. Um, the other guys, yeah, sure, okay. You're, you, you work in the tech industry, you hold a high position. Sure, if you're available, fantastic. So they come to this, this panel and before they even get there, the community is uncomfortable. And when I say the community, I mean the, the female developers, designers, particularly the ones that go to Grace Hopper. We're like, you know, we're not really sure why you chose these guys or why you reached out to them. We hope the panel's gonna be good, but we just don't know. So the panel happens and it kind of all goes to hell and back. So they proceed to spout off in a variety of ways what women in this community label as kind of propaganda. They're kind of trying to cover up that there's a problem. They're listing off things like, oh, you should speak up and be confident. And the women got vocal in the audience. And they said, this is ridiculous. They were shouting no. Apparently there was a bingo card of all of the terrible, terrible things that men would potentially say on these panels, and somebody shouted, bingo, because she got a bingo. Um, I don't think they get it, and I think these quotes kind of illustrate that. Um, it's more expensive to hire women because the population is smaller. I just did recruiting, and the only way it could be more expensive if I literally pulled the women who gave me their resumes and then took them to dinner individually. That's the only way it could get more expensive. It's not like you're targeting all women's colleges. It's absurd. Um, it'll be twice as hard for you, but you can make a difference in your company. I don't believe that either. It shouldn't be twice as hard. I have fantastic mentors. I have my manager. I have my second level manager, my third level manager all of which are very happy that I'm at Intel. They're happy to listen to me whenever I have problems. I have at least two mentors. All of these people are men, and all of them want me to bring more women in, and all of them are happy to have more women. So, twice as hard? No. Ridiculous. So finally, what can you do? Because um, I know that's what you guys have kind of been talking about um, in your class. So I have some very generic things. One is when anyone is speaking, you listen to them. You listen to their ideas. They might not be your favorite ideas. You might not support their ideas, but you listen to them anyway. Um, fostering a non-toxic atmosphere. So if you're working in a group, you're in class, you go out into industry, you have an internship, whatever, you make sure that you call someone out when you see their behavior. If they're being absolutely ridiculous and it looks like it's directed at women, can ask them. Do you have a problem? Should be always comfortable to say something like that. And it'll help this community get better. And then finally, just a reminder that creativity thrives in a diverse environment. So just like my friend Zach was saying at Happy Hour, he likes working in groups with men and women because he thinks it gives a better result. Yeah, that's it. <laughs>